This is Ned's AFL Unpopular Opinions with Alistair Lynch, Tom Rockliffe and Dylan Leach. And thank you, Craig Willis. Welcome to a world where the Gold Coast Suns sit on top of the AFL ladder with a percentage difference of 26% for the Giants, who who sit second after round zero. Four other clubs will go into round one minus four premiership points. Meanwhile, 10 teams haven't even played yet. We've had a weekend of thrilling comebacks, momentum swings, big statement wins from the expansion clubs. In what was truly a bizarre, yet some would say successful start to season 2024. Was round zero a success? Maybe. We'll be the judge of that on this program. Are we excited for round one? Is this upcoming weekend the proper start to season 2024? The answer to that is yes. Yes, it is. Resume normal programming. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ned's AFL Unpopular Opinions. My name is Dylan Leach, and I happen to be on this show because I was in the right place at the right time. Firstly, a big welcome to everyone who is getting us on the Listener app for the first time. Uh, We are delighted that all Ned's podcasts and the NRL boys included uh, are going to be part of the leading podcast network in Australia. And they only take the best. So if you want to listen to Dead Set Legends South Australia into Ned's AFL on popular opinions in one spot, the Listener app is where it's at. Tom Rockliffe would know about that. Uh, We are truly a national show today. We are putting the A in AFL here. It's an early... Monday afternoon record this week. I'm here in Melbourne, but 208 games for the Lions at Port 2014, all Australian. And the pride of Benella, Tom Rockcliffe, joins me from Brisbane. Tom, hello. Dylan, thanks for having me. Yes, ripping round zero um, on the weekend. I thought it was outstanding. Games everywhere. Gold Coast, we've seen the absolute best of them in the first half. So exciting times for sure, Dil. Now, it was uh, quite the game and quite the scene for the Gabba on Friday night. And what really stood out where I was sitting was this man just standing under the big screen behind the goals, overlooking the Blues and Lions thriller, a takeout, breakout in front of him. It was sort of akin to seeing Sattler and Waldorf from the uh, Muppet Show, as <laughs> I saw John O'Brown and Alistair Lynch just looking above, and even Nathan Buckley, three greats of the Brisbane Football Club. I am, of course, talking about Alistair Lynch. He's actually in Perth. What are you doing in Perth, Lynchy? I'm in Perth, um, actually doing a, uh, a real job. So I've been out on a couple of uh, industrial sites. As you know, I've got a health and wellbeing business. So mm-hmm. we're running a few programs over here. So I've got a big week traveling around uh, sites in Perth, Kalgoorlie right. for the next couple of days, and then down to Esperance you're before not, heading home. You're not trying to get Harley Reid down to Tasmania already, are you? Yeah, well, just, just quiet conversations he, just uh, behind the scenes. Uh, someone from the West Australian is listening to this right now. That is tomorrow's well, you know back page. Is, um, you know who is a uh, Tasmanian, a prominent Tasmanian over here in WA? You, you might know. Who's but that? Uh, the big captain of the Fremantle Dockers, Tasmanian. Alex oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, you'll be having a coffee at uh, Geno's in Fremantle with him, I would assume. Is that Although, right? it yeah. does appear that I'm on the GWS bandwagon with the high vis shirt that yes. I have to wear the whole time. Yes. Yeah. And the, the reason I've taken it off is because it's sparkling clean and does stand out on site. Quite embarrassing. Never a hard day's <laughs> labour in that shirt, it, I can assure it, you. It's very much like seeing a politician with the hard hat on at a construction yeah. site. Yes, yeah. real, real those sorts of vibes. All right, this week on the show, Lynchy's Locker Room makes its debut. I'm looking forward to that. Ryan uh, will join Tom to crunch the numbers and have a crack at the multi into round one. But first, and in the spirit of this show's namesake, let's get our unpopular takes from the weekend gone by. We'll start with you, Tom. Yeah, well, mine's pretty obvious. If uh, anyone follows me on Twitter, it is that uh, <laughs> Collingwood Premiership hangover is the biggest overreaction of all time, in my opinion. Um, I, I think they just came up against a red-hot, hungry Giants outfit, probably a little bit underdone. Um, Collingwood a couple of weeks behind where they want to be, but uh, a few a few niggles going into that game. But all the talk about them, premiership hangover, they've celebrated it too hard. I mean, it's so hard. I, I don't know. I never <laughs> never won one, but Lynchy knows how hard they are to win. You, you've got to enjoy them as well. But they did all their commitments, their Fox footy commitments, and uh, watched it back, the, the premiership, and, and got still got clipped for that as well. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, it was staggering some of the commentary around that. I thought they... They, they clearly got beaten by a better team, but the premiership hangover after round one against a, a red-hot um, Giants is a massive overreaction. I think AFL 360 has the Collingwood in crisis montage good to go tonight. <laughs> uh, we're recording this on the uh, Monday afternoon. 
Lynchy, your unpopular take from round zero. Well, I'll go just with Rockies to start with. I mean, that is a massive overreaction. Mm. As you said, Rocky, I mean, the Giants are, are going to be pushing for a flag this year. They're a very mm. good side at home. And Collingwood have gone in uh, with a few key injuries. Um, yeah, and they're all, you're not going to be as desperate first game after a premiership. They're, they're looking forward to qualifying to do the same again. So now it's an overreaction. Um, it was on the cards. But then you didn't t- tip Collingwood, though. Who tipped Collingwood? I tipped Collingwood. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's it's uh, round. I'll, put, I'll, I'll say this: round zero means zero tips. Uh, yeah, yeah well, <laughs> now over, that's a, a overreaction, massive overreaction. Um, this mightn't be popular, but well, it's I'm unpopular. Gonna... It's unpopular opinion. Yeah, well, this may be unpopular, so <laughs> it's not going to be popular. Isn't that <laughs> no, the same thing? No, go go go, go ahead. Sorry, Lindsay. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, you do what you need to do. I think there's a valid reason uh, for. The Brisbane Lions third quarter drop off. We saw in the first half, um, outside the last five minutes, which Carlton were exceedingly well. And this is not taking anything away from Carlton mm. whatsoever. Um, Brisbane were so good with the ball, but their pressure on the opposition was elite for that whole first half. Just before half time, their one, one of their rising, rising stars has gone down, which was obvious at half time was an ACL injury. They were waiting for scans, but everyone knew um, he, young Cadigan Coleman had done his ACL. Now, I'm not saying that's why Carlton won, but I think it's a valid reason why there was a drop-off in intensity in that third quarter um, because you see one of your young stars go down with an ACL. It, it breaks your heart to see that. Now, we didn't realise too afterwards that Sam Doherty's had an ACL as well, and that would have ripped the guts out of the team, but they didn't realise the significance of that injury. So to take nothing away from Carlton, but I think there was a natural drop-off in that third quarter. Now, Brisbane bounced back in the last quarter, but Carlton had got up and going and were far too good in the end and deserved the win. So I just think at halftime, and I don't know whether you've been in the rooms in that sort of situation, Rocky, um, but it does tear the guts out of a, a team. And I think that's probably a valid reason why they just couldn't keep up with Carlton, who were on the on the rampage in that third term. Yeah, it's emotionally draining, isn't it? Not draining, but yep. it's overwhelming, and and the group would have all felt that and been feeling for him. And you've got to somehow motivate yourself to go back out there and and fire up. And and Carlton were clearly too good in the end, but um, that was a probably surprising thing because Brisbane have really dominated the third quarters um, all for the last couple of years, particularly at the Gabba. I think Ryan had a stat last year where they. I think they're plus four four goals to their opposition. So it's a massive, massive win for Carlton to be able to turn that game around and shift momentum. Yeah, and so they started that you know just before half time, and I think just with with Carlton's resurgence and the uh, significant injury, it just um, yeah one and one went together and it meant no pressure in the third quarter. So great, one of the great wins for Carlton, one of the great wins for Michael Voss. Um, but yes, a, uh, a significant injury played a massive role. I'm putting it out there that that was the best game I have seen at the Gabba live, excluding a certain grand final, obviously, but that is one of the best games I've seen in Queensland live. It was, it was simply it... outstanding on Friday night. And I don't know what everyone thought, but I must, and it doesn't really, I mean, I want Brisbane to win, but I don't think without a, a bias, I thought they'd win by 30 plus points anyway. So mm. sort of going through the first one and two quarters, I think, well, this is the way I thought it was going to go. Mm. It's such a significant turnaround in momentum, which Carlton did in time on of that um, second quarter to turn it around and then impact the scoreboard. And um, you, know, you can't help but go past Sam Doherty's injury. But on, the, uh, on the upside, there was a couple of players in that third term that I've never heard of uh, playing for Carlton. And um, <laughs> I think we'll hear a bit of them moving forward because they were outstanding. And one I've really felt um, pleased for and we spoke about him in our pregame on Fox as well, is Harry Mackay to, to one, want the ball. Because I reckon there was stages last year that he almost didn't want the shot. Um, but he looked like he craved the shot. And that the mark he took on Harris Andrews in that last quarter was one thing. To get the distance and get the mark, that was one thing. But to go back, soak up the pressure, not rush it, go through his routine and actually kick the goal... That's that's first class. That could just launch him into a great year. Now, he's going to have his ups and downs, but um, that's a huge step in the right direction for his team and himself. How much of a monkey off the back is that game for Harry? Well, he's just got to... I mean, his teammates would have been telling him this all the time. You're a great kid. You're a great player. 
but you could just see the impact of poor poor shots at goals impacted the rest of his game. It's almost like someone who gets the yips in putting. You mm. think you try to make up for it with your drives off a tee and your game falls apart. It was um, bits of that. I love the idea, and we've sp- I think we've spoken about this for the last couple of years, get him into the ruck just to give five minutes break to have some uncontested ball in the middle of the ground. But I think it is a big monkey off the back. Now, he's going to have his stages, but he needs to reflect back on that, that he can do it. We know he can do it. And I think, um, yeah, it's a huge step in the right direction. If you're a Carlton supporter, I would argue that three out of their last four games have been their best wins this century. When you think about it. Take us through them. Okay. Well, there's the qualifying final last year. Yep. There's the semi-final. Even they got bang for buck in the first quarter uh, against uh, Brisbane in the prelim. And then, of course, Friday night. So the past month of Carlton has just been... An unbelievably fun roller coaster. It's very similar to say the Collingwood of that what Collingwood were doing. Uh, dare I say, Carlton is the new Collingwood. Ooh, you're a gay man to say that. Hey, what's hey, um, what's unpopular? What's this show called, Tom? <laughs> unpopular opinions. Called- I was just about to ask you, yeah. what's yours from the what weekend? Is, mine is uh, it's I, I had to give a verdict on round zero. Um, now my verdict on round zero, keep it. How it is good for New South Wales and Queensland teams. They have ripped the benefits, except for the Lions, but they got the big crowd and the big exposure, and they'll be fine. But I have a concept to make round zero even better. Firstly, call it round one. The jury's out. It's called round one. <laughs> AFL table. <laughs> AFL, happen. the greatest website in the world, Lynchy. AFL tables listed it as round one this morning. Oh, and I really? go, I go from AFL tables. I don't trust yeah. what the. That's the only website I trust. Uh, but here's the radical concept for yours truly. Now, we can have all 18 teams compete, but no games in Melbourne, Geelong, Adelaide, and Perth. New South Wales and Queensland get the prime time. Other games can be utilised at destination venues. So think your Tassie, Canberra, Ballarat, Cairns, Darwin, etc. People in Melbourne will cope, okay? Melbourne gets over 100 home and away games basically all other public holidays and finals. Also, it was 38 degrees in Melbourne this weekend. I really don't want to be playing footy there. Uh, it becomes a destination event like Gather Round. Uh, it replaces the preseason, given no game seemed to be played out regional in the community series anyway. Uh, the first weekend of footy in Melbourne becomes even bigger. It's a bit like this show today. It's all over the country. It puts the A in AFL. And also, it's just a genius idea because I am a football genius to this stuff uh, when you think about it. So, yeah, I think we can keep it and it's good. And uh, I think the people of Melbourne will be fine. What do you reckon? Yeah, I, I like the concept. I think the AFL's the the real genius behind it all because they get an extra free hit, free round mm. where they don't have to pay the players because it's only 24 rounds still instead of the 25. Yep. So they've, they're have very clever with the way they've uh, done it <laughs> and uh, TV rights, et cetera. And um, I, I loved it. I, I thought it yeah. was really good. Great way to start the season. And, and you can piggyback off that deal with some regional games. And Yeah, absolutely. Th- there's no no reason why you can't have sort of the two two gather rounds almost anyway. It's um, yeah, and great for the northern it, states. Uh, but it could also be advantageous for the West Australian teams. It's like you can't play in Perth, but you can go play a game in Bunbury or joondal up at one of those arenas so it becomes a, a bit of a destination game for them um so they avoid the uh, so rather than them complaining that they're traveling they can still play at a regional ground again what i mentioned last week uh in the, the villain's delight was that rugby legs really good it's like well we've got an idea we're just going to do it and i think round zero has the incentive for footy to go this is an idea let's just do it there's still plenty of blockbusters everyone's going to get their game but this is a new way to start the season. And, you know, this weekend in Melbourne's going to be pumping. The MCG is going to be heaving pretty much every day it's hosting a match. So uh, I don't think it has that much impact on the heartland. And there'll be the usual bitching and moaning uh, from the usual suspects. But I think it, it's worth doing. And we showed this week that it was actually nice to let uh, the expansion clubs, plus Brisbane and Sydney. I wouldn't put Brisbane and Sydney as expansion clubs. They're, they're very much establishment now. Expansion um, states. Expansion states, yes. I mean, you can, uh, non-traditional footy states. I mean, we're yeah. a few k's away over here in Perth, and I've even heard positive um, feedback about uh, opening round over here. So I think it's, it's certainly worked. I agree. I think it could go to a, a second gather round as a launch in the northern states. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be huge. Um, I think it was, it was a long weekend in... Um, in Melbourne, mm. and 30% of ticket sales for the Gold Coast game were from interstate. So a lot of people were planning that and, and made the, 
the trip up. So good for them to get out of Melbourne, yep. come up to the Gold Coast, watch some footy. The sellouts were great. I think it will just get bigger. Yeah, and more teams will want to be part of it. But I think there is a way to implement all 18 clubs being part of it. So, uh, And Northern States doesn't just necessarily mean playing games in Sydney and Brisbane. That can mean using Canberra or New- Newcastle or uh, in the case of Queensland, I know there was a, it might be a bit hot, but you could play at night. Maybe maybe a game in Townsville and Cairns and those sorts of venues. Um, so there's potential there. Not sure there. I'd go to that. Yeah, not sure I'd go to that extent. No, but but <laughs> like yeah. you, you got to roll with the idea and go. Okay, well here's the extreme version, but you can do this, you can do that, and you know, uh, as you would know, Lynchy, North Melbourne, and Hawthorne have deals with Tasmania. Maybe there's a chance for some games there to start the season. That kind of thing. You, you yeah, could certainly. That was a, it was a great start. Could certainly do it and play more games. Like, there's no reason, as Lynchy said, to gather around over New South Wales and Queensland. You could play more games at the Gabba because there's so many um, supporters mm. in Southeast Queensland, ex Victorians that have moved up. You meet the the crowd at um, at on the Gold Coast was majority Richmond. They were booing Damien yep. Hardwick when he came up <laughs> on the screen and stuff yep, like that. So right. there's you could still pack the Gabba. Out. You could have a thirty thousand at the Gabba for two big Melbourne teams well, to play there. I mean. I mean, we had that experience a few years ago, although in extreme circumstances. But uh, I remember going to the Collingwood Geelong semi final at the Gabba in 2020, and the atmosphere felt like an MCG atmosphere. There's lots of Collingwood and Geelong fans there. So exactly the, the crowds are definitely the, there. Gather, gather round, uh, opening round would uh, work a treat, I think. Um, and I don't think it's far away. I think they'll um, capitalise on what they did this time with the sellouts and mm. get it going. But just call it round one. Yeah. Just, just call it have twenty five, twenty six rounds. I think you yeah. can do that and just have the floating. New TV, yeah, new TV deal next year. Give the players a bit of extra match payment for twenty four matches a year. Is that is it that bad? And so, I think what they will what they will do is with this opening round or round one gather round, which I think will come in the next couple of years, we'll see no practice matches. I mean, right. they'll, they'll they'll sack those, and I think we'll get to eventually over the next few years we'll get to round one. With no form, we don't know who's playing well. We didn't, wouldn't know that Gold Coast have played Brisbane and GWS and been no good. We'll just come into round one, and again, that expectation, that build up for round one, will be huge. Mm-hmm. And make it in the northern states, gather around, yep. and it'll be, it'll be massive. Make it, make it in the northern states, but give the regionals a bit of love as well if we're doing that. Because if there's no preseason, that's where you're used to play your games out in Bendigo or. Uh, Ballarat, or Ballarat hosts some matches anyway, but those sorts of towns, like maybe there's a chance to offer some matches to regional areas as well. Yep. And but that was yeah, that was a preseason. It didn't yep. really happen this year. No, it? no, no it, was, it was it was called the community point. Yeah, it was called the community um, series, and they're playing at community venues in Melbourne and uh, Brisbane. It was yeah, great. And can we just and we touched on it just briefly before, mm. and um, we did say about Kadeen Coleman and the impact on the change rooms and and. Guys will move on quickly, but the impact on the change rooms at halftime would have been huge. The Sam Doherty one. I mean, yes. and you just see, and I was um, part of my role with Fox Sports chatting to Sam uh, pre-game. And it was the first pre-season that he's completed um, for a long, long time because of his ACLs and obviously his cancer battles and all that sort of stuff. And he, he's got himself to round one in pristine nick. And to see that happen... Is is just devastating. We see these cruel stories for a not just a good footballer, or a very good footballer, but a, a great human. He appears. I mean, he had a couple of years with you up here, yep. uh, in or up there in Brisbane, Rocky. But um, devastating for the whole footy world to see him go down with his third ACL. Yeah, I, I actually seen him Thursday night at a brokering event um, at the same venue that they were staying at. That night, and I seen yeah. him out the front of the hotel, and he was happy and up and about, looking forward to the season. And yeah, it's just devastating for that to happen to him and what he's been through already. And then um, yeah, just to do it all again, he knows what's in front of him, which I'm sure would be hard work. I'm sure he'll go about it the right way and get it done. But to to be cruel by what he's gone through out through his life, but also his footy career, which is so much shorter, um, so so unlucky. You know him. Rocky, um, is it a given he'll go again? Well, I think he'll fight back and, and try. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, how old, he's going to be almost 30, 30-ish, wouldn't he? Yeah. He'll be yeah close sure. to 30 by the time be. he comes back. 
yeah. coming back from three ACLs, it's it's a big ask, isn't it? Like he's still good enough to certainly play. I think he'll give himself every opportunity um, to to come back, but it's going to be a long long year for him, long summer uh, to continue on. Yeah, no, devastating. And when that um, news came through, I think it was halfway through the uh, Gold Coast game on Saturday. That was uh, you could just tell everyone around in the commentary yeah. box was devastated for him. So hope it goes well from here. I don't think we could have said it better, any better myself there, Lynchy and Rocky. Thank you for that. All right, punters, now is the time to crunch the numbers, get your little info, little tidbits. Um, speaking of, uh, how you you boys did predict that Harry Mackay would kick okay in uh, your multi last week, but the Lions kind of uh, did, did your over there. But right now, Ryan and Tom are good to go with the snapshot. All the betting trends you need to know from the world of footy. This is the Snapshot. Rocky, opening round in the books, mate. Keen to get into some of the nitty-gritty. Finally, we'll talk some of the key matchups uh, we've got coming up in round one. This weekend, full slate. We've got some exposed form to go off now. Look, only a small sample size, as we know, but uh, of the upcoming games ahead, I'm really keen to get into Collingwood and Sydney on Friday night at the G. Lots of talk about Brody Grundy back in form. Enormous debut for the Swans last week. 23 touches, 15 contested, nine clearances, 31 hitouts. Rewound the clock to his uh, his best All Australian form, most would say. From a betting perspective, I think this is going to prove key uh, if you're looking to bet on Sydney mil- midfielders going forward. Uh, big battle in the ruck this week with Mason Cox, who's also been in the headlines for different mm-hmm. reasons. Um, first of all, how do you see Grundy having an impact on this game? And do you think we can trust that kind of form uh, going forward into the season? Yeah, I think we can. I think as the number one ruckman, that's what he craves. That's what he's always wanted to do. He hasn't had that probably for four or five years now. We know he had some injury concerns late at Collingwood, but Darcy Cameron was there, Mason Cox as well, and he wasn't sort of the number one ruck all day. That's yep. how he likes yep. to play. Never got the opportunity at Melbourne, of course, with Max Gorn there, but we've seen what he's capable of last week. So it's a massive tick, massive win for the Sydney Swans. And I think he's got a point to prove on Friday night as well against Collingwood. He he obviously didn't want to leave. He loved the footy club. Mm. I think he'll be fired up. And the midfield group that the Sydney Swans have got, they've got stars coming through. Um, and we know that Luke Parker and others aren't there at the moment. But massive tick. It's fallen in their lap and could potentially be a driving factor for the Swans potentially winning the Premiership this year. Yeah, Swans fans have a lot to be excited about. Um, you mentioned Parker, so... Parker, Goulden, Callum Mills all had 30-plus when these two sides played in round eight last year. And just looking back at the stats, the Pies dominated the hitouts that day, 46 to 19. So Grundy could have a really big influence here. Um, We'll just quickly get your thoughts, Rock, on Collingwood because you've been been quite vocal on Twitter overnight (laughs) um, defending the Pies, defending this talk of a hangover. So... uh, Give us your thoughts there, mate. Oh, I think that everyone's jumping for them, which I think Collingwood half bring it on themselves, or that particularly their fan base do. But I think it's very early on in the season. And Giants were ready to go, breathing fire. They lost a prelim by one point. They had a point to prove on um, Saturday night. So I think that they were there to get out, po- prove their point, which they did, um, had a really good performance. Collingwood probably a, a touch underdone. Collingwood are going to be thereabouts and um, in that top four again. So I think to write them off or say that they've got a premiership hangover after one game, I think it's a bit early. Maybe after if they're still playing the way they did on Saturday night after six weeks, yep. then it becomes real. But after one game, I think it's a bit of an overreaction. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, the Pies still have a couple of key defenders to come back in as well and Jeremy Howe, so that, uh, that loss can't be uh, overstated. Look, I'm, I'm keen to get your thoughts here on the Gold Coast Suns because you called that game – uh, on the Gold Coast on Saturday, um, geez, it was a up and down contest. I'm sure you're going to sleep after that first quarter, and then things really turned on their head. So the Crow, uh, sorry, the Suns play the Crows on Saturday on the Gold Coast again. Let's talk Ben King. Uh, silenced a few of the doubters last week. Five goals after penning a new contract. Um, five combined against the Crows when they they played twice last year. Into 19 bucks now for the Coleman. Do you think we're going to get another multi-goal game from Kingy? And who do you think the Crows probably send to him? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. The Crows have a bit of flexibility down there with with their key defenders. So 
Whoever gets a matchup is going to have their hands full. Casbolt is another option inside 50 and the Kosius as well. So I'm not exactly sure who they will go with at this point, um, the Crows, but they'll do some work on it. Their midfield was exceptional on the weekend, mm. the Gold Coast Suns, and it should be too with the players they've got through. Matty Rowell's back. Matty Rowell, yeah. outstanding. We forget how good he was as an 18, 17, 18-year-old, burst onto the scene, then had the shoulder issues and just set him back a little bit. Noah Anderson, Took Miller, Jared Witts is so important to them, the way he rucks. But that was just rinse and repeat for the first half. You ride at half time, we're thinking, how are we going to call this second half? <laughs> Richmond got going, which was great for the for the game. But it was great to see King be up and about, particularly in that first half and yep. set the tone. So I think he'll kick maybe three, but they'll, they'll certainly be putting some more attention into him. Yeah, I think three is probably a bet I'd be willing to take. Uh, would you be willing to take, though, $2.40 for the Suns to make the eight? Um, it's hard to know because it's, they came up against Richmond. You just don't know where Richmond are going to be at. They were, they were as bad in that first half as any team for for a long period of time. So I wasn't sold on the Suns, what I've seen through the preseason with them. Um, I'd be keen to take the two, two dollars, two twenty or whatever's offered about the Adelaide Crows. I think they're, they're, they're the value this weekend. Can the Suns back it up? Obviously an emotional week, big big week for Damien Hardwick. Can they back it up? I'm not convinced they can, mm. but um, the, the Crows will stretch them. I've got the Crows in my top four this year, so that's, yeah, I'll probably be betting <laughs> on the Crows, to be honest with you, to uh, upset the Suns, but Gold Coast are very tough to beat up here in Queensland. Um, a market we didn't talk about much at all last week. We spoke about the Coleman, Rising Star, all the awards. We didn't talk about the Spoon, though, and uh, this is one of the more interesting markets still up on Ned's. Uh, West Coast, as you would expect, $1.70. North three dollars seventy five, my Hawks ten bucks, Richmond eleven, and the Bombers fifteen. Are you with me on West Coast here, Rock, oh, to finish bottom? Dollar seventy. That's that's it's very, free money. Very, yeah. <laughs> I won't say free money because uh, we don't want to declare yeah. that on this show. But um, I think that's great value at a dollar seventy. I think West Coast are really going to struggle again this year. Um, I think Adam Simpson will – the pressure of Cooker will be on both coaches actually over there. I think um, – I wouldn't be surprised if Longmuir gets a tap on the shoulder halfway through the season. There's a few rumblings coming out of there. So um, I think both Perth clubs will have issues this year, mm-hmm. um, but I think it's almost a lock that West Coast will win the spoon. I think most people will be watching West Coast for the Harley Reid factor. I Look, they've done a couple of nice things during the off-season. I added um, Tyler Brockman, who I know quite well as a Hawthorne uh, fan, but the fixture is very tough. They could easily be 0-8 by round 8 with who they've got coming up. Um, you touched on Justin, Justin Longmuir there. I think him and maybe Luke Beveridge are the two coaches that are on the biggest hot seat heading into the season. I said at the start of last year that Bevo could be out and the Dogs didn't make finals, but he still retained his spot there. Um, so out of those two, Longmuir and Bevo, who do you think's probably on the biggest hot seat? Oh, I think, yeah, it's probably Bevo, but I think Longmuir won't survive. So it's it's a you calling it out, yeah, willing I, to say I, it. I, I don't think he will. I think they're they're going to really struggle again, Fremantle, and um, he's what five years, five six years there now. Um, a few internal rumblings from from reports out of Melbourne last week about certain things that happened inside the footy club. So. I think once that starts to happen at footy clubs, once you, just, once you start to get stories like that, if the playing group are a bit fragmented and fractured, it's near impossible for the coach to survive them. So I think he'll be in a bit of, tr- bit of str- trouble. Bevo, I think the same. They they need to play finals. They need to be a top six yep. team. Otherwise, he's in a bit of strife. But there's a lot of coaches as well, like even my old coach, Kenny Hinckley. He's going to, if they're not sort of top four, top six, mm. the pressure's going to be on him as well. So... Matty Nix is another one. If the Crows don't improve from last year, they're five, six years under Matty Nix. If they miss finals again, they haven't played finals since 2017, I think. Yep, yep. The pressure's going to be there. So Adam Simpson's another one. If, if they start really poor and you say 0-8, if they end up 0-12, then do they make a decision and, and cut ties and go elsewhere? So it's an interesting landscape, the coaching one this year, I think. Yep. I think that we'll see a fair bit of movement towards the back end of the year. But um, out of those two, I think, the pressure's on Bevo to, to perform. I think it's always going to be on Bevo too when you've got players like the Bont, um, Aaron Norton, one of the best forwards in the comp, Jamar Ugelhagen, emerging star. Tim English is going to be, you know, a lot of eyes on him um, with clubs trying to poach Ruckman. You and, can't have that kind of list and not play finals. And the way he coaches a bit as well, the way he shifts the magnets around, people look at that team and go, pick your best 22 
best 18 positions and yep. play him in those positions. And they, they often shift away from that. We see McRae playing as a half forward at times, a winger. We know he does his best work as an inside mid, but we see all these players shifted around to different positions. That's why I think there's extra pressure on Bevo. If he picks the best team in their best position, I think they win more games. Like the, the game that sticks out is when they had to win the game last year and Tim English takes a kick in. Exactly. He yeah. needs to be yep. down the middle. He needs to be marking that ball. And I know that's a situational thing and he would not have planned for that to happen, but it just, it just amplifies the Western Bulldogs as a footy club, I think. I think Fremantle's midfield will be interesting too. Hopefully Fife can play a full year and it sounds like he's going to be playing in the mid permanently. Um, I have a big opinion of Caleb Sarong, so hopefully they those two can start to gel. But like Brayshaw as well, yeah, Brayshaw as well. The Fremantle's attacking last year though; that's what cost them that that one and three start. Got got them off on the wrong foot. They came good sort of mid season when they were attacking a bit more and a bit more hungry for the ball. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a rough time big, for Freo. Big Darcy out as well. He, he's missing the start of the season, but Luke Jackson being there, so yeah, I think Freo will be under the pump as well. Ryan and Rocky are cooking up another multi. Surely it gets up this week. Speaking of under the pump, our multi last oh. week. We went close, Rock. I, I got us off to a fast start with uh, Sydney getting up on Thursday night. And look, I'm not going to give you too much grief about this because Brisbane should have won and Charlie probably should have kicked three. So <laughs> that probably would have got up. But uh, yeah. Because anyway. we went Brisbane 1 to 39. So yes, we did. It was nervous at half time yeah. thinking it's going to be too too far. And then they, they get rolled. And Charlie, what, he let us down 2 3, I think he finished yeah. this. So, well, thereabouts. But. Uh, Hey, we go again this week. Lots to build on. You know? yes, it's, it's good sign. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this week, uh, Rock, you're going to kick us off. You like GWS at the line. The line is minus 44 and a half as we record. Yeah, we record on a Monday morning, so there's not a, a great deal of markets, but I think the Giants, the way they played on Saturday night against Collingwood, I think North Melbourne are in for a really tough, tough day against the Giants. I, I think they'll blow them away. Um, um, Toby Green was a bit quiet. I think he'll have mm. a massive game. So I think, uh, yeah, 45 points is a, a good margin. All in on the orange tsunami. You're looking at Collingwood Sydney again on Friday night. You've gone Errol Goulden, who we spoke about a little bit last week for the Brownlow. I think they'll put a bit of time into him, Collingwood. Maybe a Tom Mitchell or someone may go to him, but I think you'll have 25 plus um, on the night. I think that's um, a, a pretty safe bet. So $1.33 about that. Nice short odds. I've gone Shea Bolton just to kick two plus goals uh, against Carlton. I, look, he's a, he's a big time game player and I think he was a little bit on the quiet side last week as well. So two plus a dollar ninety six there. That's good value. And then I'm going to wrap it up with Melbourne uh, just head to head against the Bulldogs. A dollar sixty seven head to head. I don't have a big opinion of Melbourne, and I think we saw some weak signs uh, last week on attack. But the dogs are a big question mark for mine as well, especially as we just spoke about with uh, moving the ball forward and through their midfield. So uh, all of those legs combined, punters, eight dollars twenty seven. Juicy, juicy to start. Just to recap, we're going GWS to cover against North Melbourne, Errol Goulden 25-plus touches, Shea Bolton 2-plus goals, and Melbourne head-to-head, $8.27. You can find it on the Neds app. Thanks, Rocky. Another great uh, edition of the Snapshot, mate. Looking forward to talking some more footy next week. Good on you, Ryan. Good luck, punters. You're listening to Neds AFL Unpopular Opinions. Three hundred and six games, two clubs, three flags, countless stories. It's time for Lynchy's locker room. This is AFL Unpopular Opinions here on Neds. I'm Dylan Leach. We've got Tom Rockliffe. We've got Alistair Lynch, and we've got his new segment, Lynchy's a locker room. It's where we go into the depths of a champion career and hear a tale or two. And uh, Lynchy, I was reading in the newspaper. I think it was the Herald Sun. Uh, Mark Robertson had a story on your old coach. Robert Walls, who's been doing it tough. He's, ha- he's had his cancer battles and whatnot. And uh, I think probably people of Tom and I's age, we don't remember Wallsy the player, or we probably barely remember Wallsy the coach. We certainly remember Wallsy the expert on Channel 10 and the tough talking on uh, on the couch back in the day, that's for sure. But uh, you, of course, were coached by Wallsy uh, when you joined the Brisbane Bears and uh, he was a bit of a whipping boy. You were a bit of a whipping boy for him. Yeah. Well, in some respects, and I think in this se- in this segment, I think we'll um, we'll have a few laughs about some inner sanctum things, but probably not really on this occasion. But obviously, devastating news that started to just um, leak out uh, grand final week last year that uh, Wolsey 
had a uh, significant diagnosis uh, and um, the, the news wasn't great mm. that uh, he would struggle to survive too much longer. And um, that uh, started to drift out, but um, everyone in the media that knew about it weren't gonna, wasn't going to talk about it publicly, um, as was uh, Wolsey's wish. But um, yeah, we made contact with the, the great man and thankfully the diagnosis has uh, turned around at this stage. He is re in remission and... Um, going okay it's certainly still been uh, treated ongoing with uh, chemotherapy but uh, we send our best wishes to uh, robert walls that's played a huge uh, role in the brisbane lions football club with coaching and playing for the fitzroy football club then brisbane bears and um yeah he took me he was the coach that took me to um to brisbane now there was the offer of the the 10-year deal which was significant but um <laughs> <laughs> the ma and the major thing, and uh, yes, that was obviously a major part. But y you know, Rocky, when you're moving clubs, you you talk to the coach, and you've got to ha get buy-in from the coach. Otherwise, it's going to be just too hard. And yeah. I had a great chat with Robert Walls, and obviously, he's trying to get me to sign, so he maybe put a bit of mayo on on his opinion of me. But um, he, he pumped me up, and I wanted to go up and play under uh, Walsey, and it didn't quite work out. And Walsey's old-style coach, you know. He was hard. He was, you know, hard on his players. He'd, he'd train hard. You sort of in your breaks, you'd get extremely uh, raw feedback. And um, yeah, things didn't work out for us. I mean, I broke my collarbone first practice match, I think it was. Um, so I missed the first uh, about five or six weeks of that season. Broke my collarbone again and had a knee operation. So things weren't going well. And I was obviously the supposed to be the golden child to help the Bears get to the finals. And now Wolsey's. Uh, Wolsey's job was on the line the next year. I was sitting on the sidelines with a mystery illness. And um, so, yeah, I, we sort of, not so much butted heads, but there was a lot of tension there. And, um, yeah, I remember getting a, a couple of cooks uh, from Wolsey. But uh, from the time he, I finished football and his support of me has been extraordinary. Uh, he reached out even through our final series. He came up one day. I think he was doing a pre-finals uh, chat and he went through all the players and I knew we'd had a bit of history. And again, because I was on the sidelines with a mystery illness that I didn't understand. So I couldn't expect him to understand. And um, he went through in chronological order all the players that he'd sort of coached there in that um, grand final team and all the final team. And um, he missed me and I thought, oh shit, that's a bit harsh. I thought, oh, sure, we have moved on. <laughs> but... Um, he made a very special effort at the end of it to um, to uh, sort of pump me up and acknowledge that we'd we'd had some uh, battles, I suppose, <laughs> over that time. And um, no, he was he's been extremely supportive of me. He helped me uh, with starting my media career. Um, I was uh, I did one game with Channel Ten with him before Fox Sports. Mm -hmm. He offered me he he he'd, I think he'd wrote, written about twenty five years of columns in the newspapers. He'd offer me all of those just to get ideas and that sort of stuff. So a very good man. And um, over the last probably six months, I've chatted to him on a couple of occasions. And yeah, they are, they are good chats. A bit of a reflection, a bit of uh, um, understanding of where he's at now and you know, the importance of grandkids and family around him and, and those past players that uh, continue to stay in touch. So he has still got a battle, even, albeit that he's, still, he's in remission at the moment. But um, no, he's been a, a huge contributor to the game. I think just before the uh, Lions started their final series, ironically, Craig McRae was one of the guest speakers at the AFL, uh, the Brisbane Lions Hall of Fame, and as was Robert Walls to induct Michael McLean into the Hall of Fame. And Wallsy, as an icon of AFL footy, you know, got up there and presented beautifully. And I think everyone was in awe of you know his words and how he um, spoke and just his status in the game. And then to have that news pop out a couple of weeks later was was uh, extremely um, distressing for, for a lot of people. But no, good to see he's gone in the right direction now. Um, as I said, he's been a, a huge part of my football career. Yes, we, uh, we wish Wolsey all the best. And um, I guess, uh, again, my reflections of Wolsey, uh, well, he's, you know, my, the best thing about Wolsey, he was such a tough commentator. Like he was a tough coach, but he was a tough commentator back in the day. And... I'm sure you remember, and maybe you two, you do as well, Rocky, the confrontation between Robert Walls and Kevin Sheedy on Talking Footy in about <laughs> 2001, some of the best football television I've ever watched. Because um, as we all know, Sheeds and Wallsy didn't get along. 
they had their differences and uh, Wolsey just doing the whole, you wouldn't know what it's like to be at more than one club. And I coached Brisbane. It was tough. And just the tension in the studio it was brilliant. Do yourself a favor and YouTube that. He was great. His years on, his years <laughs> on the couch. Um, yep. Through those Helsin days of Jared Healy, Robert Walls, and Mike Shan. Yep. OG um, on the couch. And incredible. And they used to sort of joke about um, occasionally that Walls, he'd get the baseball bat out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he, very hard in his critique of um, some players and, as, as you said, coaches as well. I- but. Uh, he played a huge role for the Brisbane Bears. Those tough yeah. years on the Gold Coast, he certainly did. But, yeah, he'd have some – were you sent – sorry, Rocky? Yeah, I was going to say that you speak to like – I mean, we had coaches, Vossi and, and Leper, et cetera, and Walls used to come back and speak sometimes. But they some of the stories that you hear from the ex-Lions players, he was just brutal, like kicking players off um, massage tables, I think, Lynchy, if you were too young or <laughs> mm. different stuff like that, or if you didn't go hard enough. And the video reviews apparently as well were just brutal. <laughs> What about the story of, um, you hear about brutal coaching, but uh, what was the Shane Strempel story where there was a player that was a bit too, they thought was a bit too uh, loose uh, at the training group, so he got the whole team to spar against him at training one night? Yeah, that was um, <laughs> that was pre-my days on the Gold Coast, yes. That, um, yes, uh, very, very hard session. I think that some of the players uh, stepped in and stopped it in the end, but yeah. Um, no, he was certainly old school, but yes. uh, very much mellowed. And he's a great man to chat about football and chat about life. And um, yeah, he's certainly done an enormous amount for this game and in this game. So, um, yeah, no, it's good to see him going in the right direction now with his health. Yes, no, we wish Wolsey all the very best. Uh, thank you for that, Lynchy. Uh, I hope you haven't got any t- too much PTSD from any of those cooks or anything like that. But uh, no, no, it was just no? I, again um, at at the time I thought <laughs> he's been a bit a bit harsh on me. I, I thought, but again, I as I said, I didn't know what was going on. The doctors didn't know what was going yeah. on, and you've just contracted some bloke on um, big money for yeah. ten years, and um, and now we're he's out of the game. Well, the start, to start with, he didn't have me. For all but 13 games in the first year because I was just injured all the time. Yeah, and then the next time, the next year, I'm asleep mm. <laughs> for no <laughs> no reason. Um, so I understand the frustrations that I think a lot of the um, people at the Brisbane Bears went through at that stage, and certainly don't blame them at all and understand. All right, you won three flags for them in the end. I think all this in forgiven. To be fair, Alistair, I think they got bang for buck. All right, time to wrap up here on Ned's AFL Unpopular Opinion. <laughs> Time to wrap up here on the show. It's been another fantastic program and a fantastic weekend of football awaits us. Lynchy, what are you looking forward to in round one? Round one, the second round of the season, round one. Round one. I'm looking forward to the traditional opener, Richmond right. Carlton at the MCG mm-hmm. Thursday nights. The Tigers coming off a belting at the hands of the Gold Coast Suns. They'll be smarting. Hopefully they get, um, for their sake, get some of their big names back into the side. So mm. I think this will be huge. And with the the sort of probably frustration of a lot of Melbourne-based supporters not being able to go to a game of footy in yep. the first round of the year, they'll get their, get their opportunity to fill out the MCG full house in front of a um, yeah, passionate Carlton supporters, uh, which will be thinking they're up and about this season. So this will be something worth watching. Everyone in Melbourne will be Banging for it, Lynchy. They will be yeah. banging for it. Rocky, what are you looking forward to? I'm looking forward to, believe it or not, the Gold Coast Suns versus the Adelaide Crows on Saturday night. I, um, I, I think was, that's worth looking forward to. Yeah, really impressed with what Gold Coast were able to do. Their midfield is is star-studded now. Matty Rao, uh, back to his absolute best. Starts with the Ruckman. Jared Witt's in there. Um, Noah Anderson, Took Miller, they, they, they bat a bit deeper. The Adelaide Crows, everyone expects them to almost play finals footy. If the Gold Coast are the real deal and have improved, then they're actually starting favourites in this game. So I, I just think it sets up as a, a cracking contest for both clubs and, and one that they both want to win. Absolutely. I, question for you both, because you both regularly cover Gold Coast Suns and Brisbane Lions games. There's probably been stages... Uh, throughout the years that you've done it, when you get the game at, uh, what's it called now? The People's Republic of Carraro or whatever <laughs> that venue first. is called. People First. People First Stadium, where people yeah. come first. The human fund. Uh, they, um, 
you must be going, oh God, this is going to be another blowout. It, it's, it must be a nice feeling to be genuinely excited to go watch the Gold Coast Suns play now. Yeah, I think... I reckon, having done all their games... <laughs> You've oh, sorry, seen literally Robbie. every game they've ever played, Lynchy. <laughs> yeah, I think it's how long can that hope drag out for? Yeah. So how, how deep into the season have you still got hope that they may play in finals? And it's been stretching out in the last year, as we spoke about, uh, it was probably MCG against Carlton at about round 13 or 14, where it went up in smoke. But um, yeah, you think as Rocky went through, their midfield, their top four midfielders are high class. Their probably depth is the question mark. But you think, could this be it? I, I didn't have them in the eight. And I think we've got to sort of wait a couple of weeks at the very least because of, um, you know, Richmond were under-resourced and have come off the boil, obviously. But yeah, it, it is exciting. Now, there was a big Richmond contingency at the game, but this momentum might just sort of grow things with sponsorship up, membership up, get a couple of wins early. They might actually start to genuinely believe. Yeah, it's interesting at half time when the Gold Coast are blown a team away and you're like, that, that doesn't happen very often. So this is a, their first five weeks are really prime. You've got the Adelaide Crows and then they go to Ballarat to take on the Western Bulldogs. So it's not Melbourne, it's not as daunting. Have a bye, they take on the Giants in the Adelaide Hills and then Hawthorne at home. So it's a really good start for them. If they can build momentum, as Lynchy said, it just starts to snowball. Absolutely. And mine's a pretty obvious one. I'm looking forward to going to the footy in Melbourne this weekend. Uh, I'm here all week, so can't wait to get back to the MCG. I'll probably catch a game or two, including Thursday. Is it a Ned's Junket? No, it's, a, it's, Ned's junket no, it's not a Ned's there? Junket. It's a self-funded Dylan Junket. No, 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 no. Not, okay, every, not, yeah, not everything's a Junket, Lynch. Not everything. No. Uh, sometimes sometimes, it sometimes you've got to be amongst the people. People first, just like the stadium. Very good. Yes, very good. Yeah, very we believe you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this has been Ned's Unpopular Opinions for another week. Uh, before we go, Tom, can you recap this week's multi for us? <laughs> Great question. I'm going to have to um, come <laughs> I'll back I'll recap to... it for you yeah. because you had Shea Bolted to kick two-plus goals in the Carlton v. Richmond game. You've got Errol Goulden, 25-plus disposals in the Pies versus Swans. GWS to cover the line at 44-and-a-half against North Melbourne. And the Ds to beat the Western Bulldogs. Bag that all up. It's $8.27, and that's available on the Neds app in the AFL section and, of course, in the Neds AFL Open Group. Thanks, Tom. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Dil. Enjoy thank round you. one. Thank you, Lynchy. Uh, we are available every Tuesday during season 2024. Thank you to Ryan. And, of course, thank you to SEN for use of their studios this week. And thanks to Rich, as always, on the buttons. We'll be all back together in the same room next week, where I think the Tassie football team will have a name, the Devils. And we'll catch you then. Thanks for listening to Ned's AFL Unpopular Opinions. Enjoyed the podcasts? Remember to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. What's gambling really costing you? For free and confidential support, visit gamblinghelponline.org.au.